My name is uh, Rick Waynes. I'm from Vancouver. Uh, I'd like to share with you just a bit of my experience with pain throughout my life, and more specifically, uh, uh, something that happened to me very recently at St. Paul's Hospital. I say that because my hemophilia treatment uh, team is here, and I'd like to expunge them of all responsibility. In fact, they uh, were able to make the situation much better than it was. But uh, when I was, uh, I have severe, hem severe hemophilia A. So I was bleeding from a, I'm 49 years old, I was bleeding from a, a fairly young age, and my first uh, pain interventions were uh, from my mother, obviously, and uh, the one that I remember first was her telling me when I was in the middle of a, a severe bleed and probably screaming, she would uh, have me try and visualize some happy place, for lack of a better description. And uh, <clears throat> I found that, you know, had... Uh, an effect. And it was my first uh, uh, understanding that I had uh, some control over what I was feeling. And uh, then the control later in my teens, I guess, I was, I was given control of the analgesics, which uh, was great because, again, being, uh, being in the driver's seat for me is important around managing my pain. That wasn't without its own risks, though. I remember one particularly horrible ankle bleed, the kind where you'd have to sleep with your foot in a box on a pillow so that the blanket didn't touch it. And uh, I just had enough of that, so I went for the Tylenols. And I don't know how many I took, but it was extraordinarily effective because I woke up about six or seven hours later. And uh, I realized that probably wasn't a good idea to take that many. Um, then... Uh, you know, 20, 30 years later, the acute pain becomes less and bleeding less often, but the chronic pain starts to ramp up to the point where my left ankle in particular, where I did most of my bleeding and my right ankle, but the left ankle was so problematic that it was difficult for me to walk to the bus stop. Uh, I could walk further, but uh, it became a problem after that. So I began to see the end of the road for my mobility, which creates a different kind of pain. Uh, so I made the decision along with my team to get an ankle fusion. And uh, that was a difficult decision to make, but I wanted, I wanted to be able to walk. So uh, I went into the hospital, I uh, had the surgery, and I woke up in the recovery room, and I'd read all of my uh, materials beforehand, and I knew that there'd be two machines connected to me. One was a catheter block, and one was the morphine. And I laid there in the recovery room, uh, just staring at my machines that were whirring away. And I would press one, and a little milliliter thing would go, and I'd press the other, and, and I knew that there were limits in place, so I didn't need to worry about how often I was pressing it. And when I pressed one, I could watch it. And I didn't, be I can't begin, I didn't understand necessarily exactly what was happening, but I could press and watch and everything was fine. Then I was moved to the orthopedic uh, ward, the post-op ward, where I met uh, whom I will affectionately call uh, Nurse Ratchet. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most affectionate name I could come up with her for her. Uh, I, I, as a, when I was settled into my bed on that ward, I noticed that I couldn't see the, the catheter block machines or the morphine machine anymore. <clears throat> I asked, uh, I'm a fairly pleasant fellow, especially when I'm on drugs. <laughs> and I, uh, I said, do you think I could see those machines? Because I'd become used to seeing the, seeing the effect. And she said, those machines are for me, not for you. So my anxiety starts to build, and uh, I understand anxiety to be a great amplifier of pain. And uh, so my next two days on that ward with her were, uh, were difficult because uh, it didn't seem to matter what question I asked. Uh, it was a problem. Uh, any sensation I inquired about was a problem. I never got to see the machines. And uh, so I just got to, to, to the business of trying to make it okay for me, which I did. 
Um, and uh, it became very clear to me that I needed to get out of there as soon as I could because I was uh, being traumatized by this lady. Um, one minute, really? Uh, so uh, so uh, I got out, um, and which isn't a good feeling to have when you want to get out of the hospital because you don't feel like you're being very well cared for. Um, there were other problems. It wasn't simply a nurse ratchet problem. Each shift change, there was a different interpretation of the, my pain uh, regime. Uh, I was never told what my pain regime was. It wasn't until I was being discharged and talking with the head nurse that I realized that there was a range of options that I had been given by my uh, physician, which no one ever shared with me. I'm used to being uh, involved in my healthcare. My HIV team, my hemophilia team has always made me a part of the team. And my experience at post-op was that I was, I was the problem. I was someone to be managed. And uh, as a result, my uh, emotional pain went uh, uh, through the roof. I don't remember whether my ankle hurt or not. I don't think it did. It was catheterized, it was morphined. I think things were good, but I couldn't wait to get out. Uh, so thank you, and I'll stop there. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Thank you, Rick, very much for, for your experience. And I'll just uh, pass the mic to Amy Griffin, and you can introduce yourself. Thanks. I'm not sure if... This is working. So my name is Amy Griffith. Um, I'm affected by VW22A, um, and I'm from Toronto in Ontario. So I've had the physical pain, I've had the joint bleeds, I've had the dental procedures, but I find my story speaks more to the social or emotional pain as opposed to physical pain. Um, I actually did my best when I was growing up to disassociate myself and my bleeding disorder altogether um, from pain. I decided early on that if this was going to be a part of my life, that I was just going to do my best not to acknowledge it or let it dictate my choices. So in that, I decided to ignore pain altogether. Um, as a woman diagnosed with VWD and no um, family history, a large part of my disease and navigating it, even with the full support of my parents and their education into the subject themselves, I predominantly did on my own. Um, and for women in particular, it's a very unique experience growing up with a bleeding disorder, which at surface value appears to be a disease predominantly um, affecting males. So in a major way that women bleed um, is our periods, and it's a taboo topic in society, and one that we're usually made to feel ashamed of, whether that's intentionally or not, or one that we have to keep a secret. Um, I even catch myself lowering my voice, saying it out loud, and I'm sure um, saying the word period makes a predominant, maybe half of this room uncomfortable. Um, whether you will admit it or not, some of us cringe when we hear it, right? So young women everywhere go to ridiculous lengths to conceal this very big part of their life. And for women affected by a bleeding disorder, this becomes a part-time job of managing um, this monthly um, experience. And whether it is a social management, whether it's a medical management, it's a management no matter what way you look at it. So in my opinion, isolation doesn't always mean being physically alone. Um, I was always surrounded by supportive and compassionate friends and family. They were always ready and willing to advocate for me, but it didn't protect me from occasionally feeling isolated on my own. Uh, women are usually less open about their needs, even to their doctors, as they're embarrassed or simply don't know how to verbalize concerns related to bleeding and their menstrual cycle. For me, that's where my pain come fr came from. Um, I was angry, I was resentful, I was upset. I was afraid to go to school in case I bled out, um, but being... Um, I'll be kind to myself and not say nerd, but um, I was a very um, enthusiastic student, so I put myself, I made sure I went to school every day. But there was that fear, you know, that one to two weeks that I would stand up in front of my entire class as a 14-year-old girl and, you know, um, have, be covered in blood, right? Uh, it's something that was a concern all the time, and that's distracting, and it takes away from your everyday life. 
And for a short time, I did the one thing I said I never would, and I let my bleeding disorder dictate my choices, like avoiding to join the swim team, out of fear, um, social situations. And I never wanted to talk about it. I never felt that I was really given an opportunity. I grew up telling myself that my period was normal, even though I truly knew that it wasn't. Um, and this is the most common story I've heard from young women. My grandmother bled this way. My mother bled this way. I bleed this way. It's normal. You know, I don't need to dwell on it. Let's just move on. No one wants to hear about it anyway. So, you know, I'm not going to put myself in the situation where I'm forced to talk about it. So it wasn't until I had a very bad iron deficiency problem that I really needed to start discussing my needs very openly and very candidly. Um, after I was able to manage this very big part of my life. In my experience also being an ambassador for the Code Rouge program, I know a lot of women feel this way. Um, I feel the stigma needs to change um, so we can reach and appropriately treat more women, um, such as introducing ob team members to the hemophilia treatment centers and programs, um, not simply on a referral basis, but having them be a member of that comprehensive care team. Um, that they are present at your appointments and they're able to advise you early. I found for myself, I was treating my ob as a specialist. I wasn't seeing them preventatively or proactively. So it wasn't until I had a problem with, like I said, the most common way that I bled that I started to take this seriously. Um, and that leads, like I said, to all these other cascading social issues, uh, emotional issues, feelings of isolation, which um, I, I think a lot of people can probably relate to as well, a lot of women in particular. Yes, thank you, Amy, for your story. Yeah, we really appreciate that. Um, next, we'll have Ann Vaughn, the social worker from Halifax, um, just give a, uh, a letter that was given by, um, she will introduce it, from a mother that was not able to be here discussing her child's pain. And it's a privilege to do so. Um, my name is Michelle Howell. I am the proud mother of six-year-old Callum Guthrie. His diagnosis is severe hemophilia A with an inhibitor. Although I'd like to propose that a more accurate description might be that our son lives with pain caused by hemophilia. You see, in my opinion, hemophilia and pain are synonymous, but pain is relegated to byproduct status, being the elephant in the back of the room that deserves equal billing. In my experience, supporting families to cope with pain plays second fiddle despite its insidious, elusive, and subjective nature. Pain impacts our son, our family, and the ability of our team at the IWK to manage his care. The management of bleeds is the primary purview of the health care team. Even the Canadian Hemophilia Society slogan, Help Stop the Bleeding, highlights the emphasis on the management of bleeds. But the reality is, our son does bleed a lot. We've accepted this fact. Callum is a bleeder. And as you all know, where there is blood, there is pain. Beyond the pharmacological management of pain, the fallout of pain is the purview of the family. I'll briefly share our experience of pain and our efforts to cope as it relates to Callum, not taking the time here to show how pain impacts his sibling Freya or the remainder of the family. Little boys who experience countless elbow bleeds over prolonged periods of time don't always behave well. Pain and fear have become unwelcomed threads that weave in and out of the fabric of his life with no apparent pattern or predictability. Pain disrupts the stability that young children depend upon and thrive from. The instability caused by pain manifests in innumerable ways. Callum can become angry, agitated, verbally abusive, and non-compliant with non-invasive procedures at the clinic. It is difficult to witness your child experiencing physical pain, but the pain also eats away at his spirit. After these outbursts, I see that he feels remorseful and perceives himself to be unliked by his health care team. He is sensitive to adults' anxiety around dealing with him, and this compounds his own anxiety. In the community, we have witnessed impulsivity and challenges with self-regulation, although he is gaining skills in these areas with age. Pain can often strip this little boy of the joy of basic play, but we work hard to create safe, creative spaces and outlets that are enabling him to flourish despite the challenges. Pain will continue to be a part of Callum's life. 
In an attempt to foster resilience, we've adopted a health promotion harm reduction approach to living with hemophilia. We have explored non-pharmacological approaches to coping with pain, borrowing from other chronic illness, and some we just figure out. For example, the use of weighted blankets as used for children living with autism. The use of a spin bike in the home as used in the school setting for children with ADHD. The building of forts, small spaces as safe retreats, monitoring levels of noise, and using headphones as utilized with kids having self-regulation challenges. Other modalities we utilize include mindfulness training, time in wilderness settings, promoting art and music, therapeutic animals, sailboats, raised sand and water tables, and a play garden. We are constantly scanning the environment, looking at settings and products seemingly designed for one purpose and adapting them for the purpose of supporting Callum's ability to cope with pain. The team at the IWK have come up with strategies to support Callum in the, in the clinic, including limiting the number of adults in the room, lowering the lighting, engaging the child life specialist, educating emergency room staff, etc. They have gone above and beyond in their attempts to support us. I know members of our team feel frustrated and helpless with the obstacles that we present, and for this I feel saddened. But as parents of a son on the extreme end of the hemophilia spectrum, it's our job to advocate for his mental health as well as his physical health. This has put us at odds with our team. For the record, at times I should say, for the record, we acknowledge that the answers do lay with the medical do not lay with the medical practitioners nor the NSH, but require us as parents to dig deep and do a better job to manage our own fears, requests, and expectations. This is a work in progress. It is hard to say if Callum's behavioral challenges are the result of pain. What aspect can be attributed to personality, parenting, or all of the above? We have no knowledge of raising a child with a chronic illness. It has been a steep learning curve for our family, with many missteps made along the way. It is not possible to assign blame, nor is it constructive. Pain is the antecedent predicting our son's future. Individuals living with bleeding disorders need to be resilient. How are we going to facilitate resilience? In my opinion, psychosocial health as pain Sorry, psychosocial health as it relates to pain needs to be in the forefront. I would like to see best practices across the country include expanded psycholo psychology services and mental health promotion as part of the care team, as well as better mental health training for the individuals living with hemophilia, their families, and practitioners. There is also a need to provide respite support to families. In closing, I would argue that the short term and long term term costs of not supporting a family's ability to cope with pain goes beyond the money invested in the research and the treatment of hemophilia itself. I can speak from my own observations and experience of the cost of non-compliance in the clinical setting, loss of income, the burden on relationships, combined with the social and health inequality associated with disability in the future. Callum's experience of hemophilia and pain is that of an outlier. It doesn't reflect the experience of the majority of families living with the condition. That said, we don't expect the system to change, but rather we'll continue to share our perspective as well as look externally for supports. Lastly, I want to thank you for listening to our story. Sincerely, Michelle. Okay. Um, Thanks, Anne, for providing Michelle's story, and, and I hope you pass your thanks on to her as well. Um, next, we have Jaywan Her from um, Saskatchewan, and uh, he will tell us uh, his pain experience. I feel that my story is con in correspondence with the last story. Uh, the, I believe that that story that we just heard is a chapter that's unfinished. And I believe and I hope that my story is the chapter that is finished within Calm's life because... In my experience, I have gone through the lows and extreme lows and extreme highs with hemophilia, and I feel blessed to be part of this opportunity. I'm a severe hemophiliac A. Uh, I'm from Regina, Saskatchewan, the greatest city in Canada. Uh, <laughs> um, sometimes I feel that I shouldn't be here. Sometimes I feel that I shouldn't be at this place right now. My story begins in uh, Seoul, South Korea, and I was born there with, um, and I started having these seizures late at night, 
and I started getting these fevers every single night, and my parents didn't know why. And uh, they found that they thought that I had a mouth uh, infection. So without knowing that I had hemophilia, they went, underwent a surgery, and I cried and I howled, and my mom kept telling me about the terrors that she got from those noises. It was until, uh, it was until three months, and I had a brain bleed, a spontaneous brain bleed, and, and uh, I started having these seizures, and I finally went to the do- um, e- ER where they diagnosed me with hemophilia pretty miraculously. And they told my parents that I probably will be disabled or die from the surgery that I was about to go under. And that's sort of a pain that is un- unmatched or unparalleled to a parent, knowing that your kid's going to be, A, going through the surgery, and B, having this trouble for the rest of his life. And in South Korea, the infrastructure for hemophiliacs uh, obviously contrasts with Canada. Uh, Korea is considered a first world country. However, the infrastructure for support and management for hemophilia is far less superior, uh, far, far more inferior to Canada's. So my mom was given a short video to uh, how to parent on how to parent with a hemophiliac, and and then she was set off. And I remember, as a kid, I remember this one instant, and my hands are real fat, and it's not good, and I have no veins that are visible. And I remember my mom poking me 12 times one night trying to find a vein. And I just remember that sticking out in my childhood. And I don't know, it, may, it, it had a profound effect on my mom and I. who had, We have a great relationship that is one of best friends. But I'm, I, I'm sure my mom remembers that to this day as well. Uh, in Korea, I had a major bleed when I was three. I fell off a couch and I didn't tell my parents. And I left it untreated, a left ankle bleed for more than 24 hours. To draw a metaphor to what that ankle would look like, imagine a balloon and that would be what my ankle would look like. And since then I've had chronic pain in my left ankle, uh, not a chronic pain, chronic joint with my left ankle that, is, that has been bugging me for a very long time. Now I think that the impacts of pain in the first 10 years of my life has uh, affected me two ways. A, I think that it has made me more resilient. It had made me more courageous and tough, given that you are faced with this sort of abstract notion of pain that eats away with you all the time. Just going to the hospital with my mom at 1 a.m. because my toe was swollen to, the, to non-belief, and knowing that you might not have enough medicine that is quoted by the South Korean government to make it last through the month, and knowing that you don't really have the opportunity to go out and play or be a normal kid for the first bit of your life. And I think if from that translates into sort of the anxiety that I sometimes feel. My mom has often accredited the sort of mental anxiety that I feel at times to the instances that I mentioned before. And although I have no medical or uh, biological substantiated proof that sometimes when I feel anxious, it may be caused by pain, but I can't imagine that sort of pain imposed on a kid being good for his mental health. Now, I've, I hope that the next 10 years of my life, I'm 20 years old now, is a bit of a happier story than the first 10. My parents decided to immigrate from uh, South Korea to Canada, in the middle, middle of Canada, in Regina, I don't know why. <laughs> but but uh, we immigrated when I was 10, and for a bit the pain didn't stop for a short period of time. We got to Canada and we saw one of the doctors and he said, so you have hemophilia, yeah. So you're getting this medicine from this country, yeah. Then why are you here? That left a profound effect on my mom and dad and myself as well. And that is a motivating factor for me exact to this day to work hard to match the question that he asked. And why are you here? Why are you taking advantage of us? And then... Everything started going, uh, becoming better. Um, my mom enrolled me in the Regina Optimist Dolphin Swim Club, and I would probably not be here with you today if I didn't join swimming. Susan mentioned the importance of exercise, and I believe that exercise should be a key cornerstone of every hemophiliac that is out there. I joined heat swimming, and I, uh, I started, started training nationally up to 20 hours a week. Morning, night, morning, night, morning, night, with school in between. 
I qualified for nationals. I swam there. I swam internationally. I swam everywhere. And I started getting fitter. I started getting better at everything that I do, and I started feeling healthier. And ever since then, I don't remember a time where I've had such bad pains that I felt in the first 10 years of my life. And I can directly tell you that that correlates between the physical strength that I gained from swimming and the kinetic advances that I've made as a human being from being in the sport of swimming. And for me, dealing with pain revolves around happiness. Whether, whatever that happiness may be for you, use it. Get whatever it takes to get your mind off the pain that you're encountering at that moment. I'm going to fast forward to uh, the advice I'm going to give to every hemophiliac healthcare professional and the parents in the room today. Use the exercise as a tool to eliminate pain from your life or lessen it if, it allows, if your body allows it, whether it may be swimming, any other impact, non-impact sports that your physiotherapist may uh, recommend to you. Play it, do it, and get really good at it and do it until you can't. If you do that, you'll get stronger, healthier, fitter, and your life will become better as a result. And also, implement happy things that you can do in your life, whether it may be playing, playing sports, uh, watching TV, listening to music, playing to music, whatever it is, get passionate about it, get good at it, and make sure that you can utilize it to get your mind off things. And in closing, I want to just end off on a happy note. Uh, everything, uh, for me, the narrative of my story is that it gets better. Within the f life that is 100%, 50% of my life was excruciating. And the 50% after, was it's, it's been heaven on earth. <laughs> to draw a real image of what my life is right now, I'm trying to enter law school. My dad went back to school, but he was an auditor for the government of uh, Na National Agricultural Bank of Korea as an auditor, but then he went back to school to become an engineer. And I think to round out this whole story, my mom went back to school in Canada to become a registered nurse. And, and, <laughs> and you know, it's easy for me to say it gets better for a lot, when there's a lot of people that it didn't get better. But I think that there, to a certain extent, you get to dictate how your story ends. If you're able to listen to your physiotherapist, find your happy places, and do, go swimming, go do something, and really up, go above your threshold of abilities to match uh, great competitive and athletic levels, I think that you can deal with it. And I think it will get better. Thanks. Um. I, I just want to uh, thank Jay greatly, and I, and I have to add that I, I didn't uh, bribe Jay in any of that talk <laughs> at all. Um, our last uh, panel member is Shelley, and I'll let her introduce her story. Um, I must say on my watch, um, we have just used up 48 minutes because it took me a while to corral everybody in here. So I think we're going to try and take our hour. Um, if you have to slip out for lunch a little earlier, um, we won't, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put a blind eye to that. But we are going to take our full hour. We think this is in a very important session. So thank you, Shelley. Hi, I'm Shelley Blackear from PEI, the greatest province in Canada. <laughs> um, my story is probably a little later in life, one of my um, pain stories. Um, I, I was listening to Amy speak and it kind of was similar to my first 30 years. <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit of what's happened after those first 30 years. Um, in 2005, I had a partial hysterectomy where I removed my uterus because of heavy bleeding. Um, it was uh, a time of very heavy mental anguish as I had delayed hemorrhaging after my surgery. And um, at that point, the fear of death became something I had to, I had to deal with. Um, it wasn't a great time in my life. Um, but I put it behind me. I moved on. Uh, unfortunately, three years later, I developed hemorrhagic cyst on my ovaries. And for three months in a row, I ended up in the hospital with debilita debilitating pain on morphine. Um, I, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know where to go. 
Um, by the way, I have von Willebrands. <laughs> I forgot to say that at the beginning. Um, type 1 severe. Um, so for that time, um, I, I got in contact with my hemophilia treatment nurse, and um, they sent me to two doctors. Uh, both doctors, one told me, don't ever remove your ovaries. You will just cause more problems later in life. The other doctor told me, you have no choice but to remove your ovaries in order for you to relieve your pain. So here I was faced with two diagnoses. Um, we tried six months of injections in my back to suppress my hormones and put me in menopause to see if they would shrink the cyst. That helped about halfway. They, they only shrunk about half. So here I was again uh, in constant pain, um, being put in on morphine. At that point, the pain became mental. It became feelings of anger. It became feelings of hopelessness. Um, it became feelings of fear again, being alone, being broken. Who is going to fix me? Nobody can fix me. I'm, I'm all alone. There, there's, there's no doctors that can help me. I, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. Um, it, it really was a really hard time. Um, by the time three years went by of living with this, um, thanks to one of the most amazing hemophilia nurses <laughs> that I know, I'm sure her pain of listening to me call again <laughs> was probably worse for her than it was for me. Um, in 2011, I was luckily found a team in Montreal at the Saint Justin Hospital, and I was referred there. I spent three weeks in Montreal where they opened me from side to side, and I had 30 staples. Um, but I, I, I felt like for once I was... I felt like I had a new lease on life. Um, I spent five months recovering, and at that time, um, I took a new lease on life. I lost 80 pounds. I began running and exercising, and yes, it's an amazing feeling to be able to accomplish things you've always wanted to accomplish because you've been able to, to manage your pain and deal with your pain, and, and I found a way to more or less eliminate that. Um, so, so as a go-forward basis, um, and, and what I want to kind of give as a message is I, I don't know where I would be without the CHS, without the hemophilia treatment nurse, without uh, my chapter especially, um, and without all those people standing behind me supporting me. Um, that, that's what it's about. It's the support. The hope can go, the hopelessness will go away. The anger will go away. Being alone, you aren't alone. Um, and your fear can always be conquered. Um, I just want to thank all the panel members. I think they have just uh, given us a real snapshot of what, what, what the pain experience is in the broader group from bleeding disorders. We're going to take now 10 more minutes, and Susan is just going to wrap up. Like I said, if you have to leave, that's okay. But I think Susan has some really valuable sum summaries of, of sort of the pain experience in bleeding disorders. All right, thank you again to the panel members. I just wanted to finish off by sharing a little bit of the research that we're currently working on in Saskatoon. Um, we've been doing a series of focus groups with men with hemophilia, um, asking them about their pain experiences and some of the challenges that they face. Um, so some of the things that they've told us is that they are constantly navigating uh, through a balance of, of various risks. So treating pain comes with its own set of risks, not treating pain comes with a different set of risks. So they're worried about things like organ health, addiction, um, convenience of treatment, privacy. So for example, um, if a brace has been prescribed, they may not choose to wear the brace in public because if they go out, um, then they have to face all sorts of different questions. Um, so even treatments that are helpful and, and highly effective for them, um, they have to navigate whether or not it's, it's a good thing for them to use at one time or another. Um, they don't like being defined by their illness or by the definition of, of chronic pain. Uh, they just want to be people, right? They don't want to be people living with hemophilia. That, that, they want that in the background of their life. Um, 
I'm, I'll give you this one quote here. So one of the fellows said, I don't like taking pills, like I almost refuse to. Even if I have a really, really bad headache, I won't take pills. And I asked, what is your caution about taking them? He said, I just don't like it. I don't want to damage my liver. If I have a severe, severe headache, I might take acetaminophen. I don't like getting needles, and I don't like taking pills unless I have to. Um, so, so there's lots of hesitation around the treatments that even ones that they do find effective and of course there's different perspectives on that. Some people uh, in these focus groups have told us that they will regularly take medication uh, regardless of how they feel just because they, they want to keep on top of things. Other people say, you know, I'll die before I take medications. Uh, so there's definitely different understandings and, and perceptions of treatment. Um, some of the challenges that they face are that if they if they want treatment, um, they go to look for information for treatment, it may not be there. There's a, a complete lack of, um, not a complete lack, but very little research on the safety and efficacy of, of uh, treatments for people with bleeding disorders, as well as some of the long-term consequences of, of taking medications in particular. Um, they have a lot of challenges around managing various men, uh, multiple health conditions. And, and they face resistance as well from healthcare providers, not necessarily the bleeding disorders team, but particularly their primary care providers, um, both in lack of knowledge and lack of willingness to prescribe certain treatments. Um, here's a quote from a fellow who uh, was seeking surgery for his shoulder, and the surgeon uh, said, well, with your hemophilia, we can't do surgery. Um, and so his response was, well, you know what? I'm so sick and tired of specialists and everybody saying they just don't want to do surgery because I'm hemophiliac. Like, I just tell them, don't even go there. Um, like, tons of people with hemophilia have surgeries. It's not a big deal. I'm so over it. Just another thing that people don't know. Um, so our people in the focus groups told us that they are often advocates for their care, um, and they they tend to be the information source, particularly for specialists and for um, the primary care provider. They said they feel like guinea pigs when they go into the hospital because they'll be swarmed by residents and all sorts of people trying to see the, the hemophilia person. Um, so they said that that's kind of annoying. Um, the same thing when they go out in public if they have surgery scars or, or braces, uh, that it's, it's very invasive. People ask a lot of questions, and so they, they come up with really creative ways to, to distract from this. So one fellow said he, he was covered with surgery scars and walking on the beach, and somebody asked him, and he said, well, that's what happens when you jump out of an airplane without a parachute. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, they come up with creative ways, but it, it's still it's, it's that in privacy invasion that they have to deal with as well, and feeling like they don't understand they're not understood. So, um, you know, talking to a neighbor saying, yeah, my knee really hurts today, and the neighbor says, yeah, I could only run three miles today instead of my usual ten, and, and just, you know, feeling like, ugh, go away. <laughs> Um, so they have become experts in seeking out information. They have a number of different sources of information that they, they rely on, um, although primarily they get a lot of their information from Dr. Google, uh, which may or may not be a great source of information. What they've asked for is that information about pain management be presented to them in a toolbox so that they can select, pick and choose what's going to be beneficial on that day, which may be something different than what works the next day, rather than parceling out bits and pieces pieces of information about pain management presented all at once so that they can make informed choices. Um, I'm going to skip that one in the issue of time. Um, so we are continuing these focus groups. Uh, we have one more with the men with hemophilia. We're looking into perhaps expanding to other populations, perhaps some women with bleeding disorders as well. Um, we're also looking at clinical applications for the information that we've gathered as well. So we currently have another study underway developing a pain treatment planning questionnaire, which is essentially, here I'll show you a picture of it, um, that's a two-page questionnaire. It looks very busy, <laughs> um, but it is on the first page. It is a questionnaire about their pain experience. On the second page, it lists the four P's of pain treatment, um, and then it begins the conversation with the bleeding disorders clinic of, of what is appropriate care, um, what they want more information on, um, and so hopefully it will it will be effective. Um, one thing that I, the last point that I wanted to make is that pain management is, is challenging. It is not a simple, you know, there's no silver bullet for it. Um, it requires coordination of care between the specialty services programs, the bleeding disorders, perhaps pain clinics, if, if you are lucky enough to have access to those. Um, other, you know, infectious diseases clinics, all of those need to work together with the primary care provider who is the one who should be in charge of medical management, uh, pharmaceutical management, um, and coordinating acute and emergency services, 
providing information and activity supports and providing opportunities for our people with bleeding disorders to access self-management um, training. So that requires um, a certain level of coordination that um, the bleeding disorders program may not be in charge of, but they certainly can contribute to um, and may be play a, an important role in advocating for that coordination and, and identifying how that happens. Um, so to summarize, managing pain is more than just fixing the underlying disease or, or damage. Um, doing things that change the nervous system is really, really important. Uh, pain management, of course, is, it requires the 4P approach and uh, a team approach involving the family physician and also the person with the bleeding disorder. And most importantly, have a plan and check it regularly. So to finish off, the answer to life, the universe and everything. Uh, you won't always get rid of pain by getting rid of the underlying disease, different types of pain, match the pain treatment to the type of pain, and yes, you can change chronic pain, particularly with physical activity. Thanks, Jay. I didn't bribe him either. Um, and physical activity and improving sleep, you can change that sensitivity of the nervous system. And thank you very much for your attention.